Glenn, thanks for the introduction. Um, I have tried somewhat to uh, take Glenn's instructions and talk uh, less about uh, Genie, which is my particular project, although I will talk a fair amount about Genie, and a little bit more about innovation, uh, how we're looking to further innovation uh, with Genie, and what we might do here uh, to, to continue to innovate in, well, you know, at least in the space that we've come to talk about. Um, so in addition to being uh, the Genie project director, I don't usually talk about this when I uh, represent Genie, but I'm uh, at BBN Technologies where I'm vice president for technology development. Um, usually that just takes too many words and, and isn't worth bothering. Um, but today's kind of a big day uh, for, for us at BBN, so uh, I'm going to brag just a little bit. Um, and uh, in, I don't know, what time is it? About 10? Okay. So in about an hour and a half, um, I'm going to be probably sitting in the back, not participating, watching a little video. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, that, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm up here publicly apologizing. Um, and it's because it's uh, I'll probably cry too. Um, <laughs> the, the organization I've given the um, better part of, well, more than half of my life to, at least professionally, uh, this guy um, is going to uh, present this, uh, the National Tech Medal of Technology and Innovation. Look, I'm crying already. Um, <laughs> uh, to BBN uh, this afternoon at uh, something like 2 or 3 uh, Eastern Time. This is a reasonably big deal. Um, <laughs> You know, all of us are very fired up, and um, this is not, you know, I think what's particularly cool uh, for me from this is, this is not for any one particular uh, innovation. Uh, BBN's been around for something like 65 years, um, and has a, a reasonably extended history of innovating uh, in a number of spaces, uh, acoustics, information technology, um, I've seen a bunch of them, and you know it's it's wonderful to exist in a culture that has an ongoing story of innovation, and I, I will tell you that it is, you know, at least in my experience, and I'm sure in all of yours, uh, extremely difficult to recognize the most important <coughs> innovations as they're happening. Right? They, you see them emerge over years and, and decades, and you realize that something you were working on uh, a while ago is important. Every once in a while you have the breakthrough where you say, oh my god, you know, I, I know today that this thing is, is terribly important. Uh, but you know, people are fond of, of quoting, uh, must have been, I think Einstein, as saying you know, people don't recognize opportunity because it comes dressed in overalls and looks like work. <laughs> right? um, this, is, you know, this is the same about uh, about innovation. It, it's a, a constant effort of making small tweaks, uh, plotting changes, uh, sort of continuing to push uh, the borders of science slowly, uh, so, you know, until you actually uh, get somewhere or, you know, discover that this is yeah, yet another dead end and it's time to, time to backtrack and, and try it again. <coughs> so, you know, enough bragging about the company of which I'm very proud. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about how we do this you know, ourselves in, you know, in, in this community. So this is not the most coveted uh, medal awarded to uh, technology geniuses around the world. This is the, uh, the Genie Demo Genius <coughs> Medal, uh, which you know, I and several others awarded to you know, several dozen uh, people who came to a, a Genie Engineering Conference uh, at uh, uh, Renzi in North Carolina, I think. Duke, Renzi, yep. Uh, in uh, GC7 a couple of years ago. And what we're trying to do in Genie, and what I think uh, we'll be trying to do here in the Ignite community, is to make sure we enable large numbers of innovators with the kinds of gadgetry, uh, the kinds of tools that they can use, that we can use, uh, to 
spread our innovations widely uh, across the country, um, into uh, individual cities, and to, uh, you know, to make sure that they actually have some penetration. So how do we keep innovation moving? How do we keep you know, the dozens of people wearing these things? Um, you know, Ed said that I could, I could have the other metal to bring to meetings, but we have to get it first. So <laughs> I'll keep waving this around for a while. You know, and, and the way to keep things moving, well, is, like I said, to give them the right, the right toys and tools, so we represent a particular community. I mean, we're talking here about uh, advanced networks, about uh, distributed infrastructure for computing. You know, we, we have some specific areas that we're, we're focusing on. So for this particular community, one way we want to talk about keeping innovation moving is by giving our community the opportunity to program everything for you know, some, some useful definition of everything. And I'll, I'll sketch out a little bit of everything. This is not everything, but these are at least um, four bits of technology that seem to be useful, uh, seem to be relevant to our community, and, and seem likely to hang around for a while. Okay, so here's one of them: um, computers. Uh, we've mostly grown accustomed to programming computers. Um, you know, as, as Glenn pointed out, this is actually the the one thing in our a large distributed networked world that we're, we're pretty sure we all know how to program. So great, well, let's hang on to that. Uh, we're not going to be needing to do a lot of uh, new invention in this space. Uh, but let's make sure we make you know, these available in conjunction with the, the rest of everything. Okay, uh, the network. We've grown, I think, you know, all too accustomed to thinking of the network as a end-to-end -end guaranteed, but not much else, uh, delivery mechanism over which we have relatively little control, uh, particularly those of us who don't run networks for a living. So we'd like to break this model, I think, and let people influence the behavior of the network in more meaningful ways. Now, there are a bunch of options for how to do this. Uh, Genie's laid bets on really two different mechanisms. Our primary bet is on software-defined networking, and I'm pretty sure that we're going to get a, a pretty heavy dose of discussion about software-defined networking uh, in the next couple of uh, presentations this morning, so I'm not going to go into that too much. But, you know, Genie's very interested in, in software-defined networking. Um, another is really in a much more simplistic approach of letting people reach in, you know, deep inside the network and program things that, you know, may or may not be uh, network switches and may or may not uh, run, let's say, OpenFlow, you know, one of the, the forms of, of software-defined networking, um, simply by virtue of allowing people to have more access points uh, deep inside the network, you get a lot more opportunity to control things. You can uh, influence the behavior of parts of your system that might otherwise have been hard to influence. I'll talk give you some examples later, but simply it, creating control points within the network is a very important capability for people who want to program everything. Wireless. Wireless base stations, wireless handsets and other devices. Um, I'm going to, well, why don't I actually take a survey, but I'm going to bet the answer is nobody. So who showed up here with one and only one device that is currently connected or capable of connecting to the hotel's network? Yeah, okay. I, I've, I've got two on me right now and another one up in my room. Okay, and I, I, I don't think I'm unusual. So there's a... a bit of a broken model uh, that we've been carrying around a long time um, because when people started designing uh, the internet, there were more people than computing devices. Okay, this is, you know, we, we all know this is now inverted and it's not going to get any better at all. It's going to get much, much worse or much, much better, but you know, <laughs> in, in the other way. And it's 
you know, it's really wireless and the sort of general existence of uh, mobile devices associated with people um, has made this problem much, much harder. Uh, we need to be able to reach inside and, and program uh, wireless devices and the wireless infrastructure that supports them. Uh, but that's generally been pretty impenetrable uh, so far. There are exceptions, uh, but you know, by and large, uh, cellular providers you know, deliver bits to my phone. Um, maybe I can hack my uh, Wi-Fi device if I'm that kind of person at my own house, but even then it's, it's a relatively limited tool. You know, we need to be able to program these. And the cloud. Okay. The cloud is one of these things that's certainly not going away. Okay. Uh, but understanding what the cloud means uh, continues to be a, a, a tremendous challenge. And in fact, the whole notion of, you know, of, of a cloud as an abstraction is designed, I think, you know, in an unfortunate way to distract us from biting off that particular challenge. Well, it's in the cloud. It's fine. Your data will be OK. You know, when you want it, come get it. We'll have it. It's a lovely model, right? I mean, that's, I think that's how we'd all like to, that's how it, it's how we'd all like to work. Um, but anybody, any of us who've worked with uh, distributed computing and with networks for any reasonable amount of time know that it's, it's certainly not true. Okay, there is, no, there is no model of the world where we don't care where the data is. And there, there are lots of reasons why we might. We might care for uh, reliability reasons. We might care for performance reasons. We might care for security reasons. We might care for privacy reasons. Um, there are regulatory issues. There are all sorts of reasons why uh, we need to understand uh, where our data is, how it's being managed. And for people who build clouds for a living, or for people who would like to see the nature of clouds improved, simply being able to run a program inside the cloud, to be able, or, or to, I'm sorry, run a program on the cloud, to take my code, spin up a virtual machine at Amazon, which I can certainly do today, um, ask it to run this code on my behalf, that, that's great. That's a, it's a very useful tool, but it's not the same as being able to re-engineer the cloud, as being able to change how it behaves inside so that we can build better clouds for the future. So you know, the way we're going to exercise the brains, and I'm not suggesting that Genie is bringing anybody a new way of programming the brain, because that's, that's your own problem. Um, <laughs> the way that we're going to let people exercise their brains is by giving them these sets of tools and making sure you can program everything. You know, I want to be able to influence the internal behavior of all of these devices, all of these parts of, of the, the computing uh, infrastructure, which have generally, with the notable exception of computers, and maybe you could argue not even those, have generally been opaque uh, to us for years. OK? Yeah, Jake says he thrives on visual confirmation. I'll, I'll take an amen or a hallelujah. <laughs> I, I'm married to a preacher. Amen. So, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what do we do? We have these tools. How do, we, how do we take them forward? Well, we try doing stuff. I mean, that's what science is. Science is, is running experiments. Right? We, we try things. We, we build uh, experimental tools. We build... Uh, new applications and try them out. You know, if you've uh, well, if you've heard a genie talk, you've seen these people before, <laughs> okay? Um, and if you haven't, then you, it's basically a requirement. And I'm I'm, <coughs> I'm sorry. This is test tube guy. Test tube guy has a great idea. Doesn't exactly matter what test tube guy's great idea is. Um, it's usually about location-based social networks. <laughs> But you know, it could be about darn close to anything. And he goes to, you know, let's say, a, a networking conference or a distributed systems conference or some other academic type event, and he, he pitches his idea. Strangely, he uses test tubes to do that. I, that part I've never understood. You know, and there's a set of people, either well-wishers or not, who say, well, how's that going to work? Uh, isn't the security model broken? How will it scale? I don't believe you. you know, these are collectively the naysayers. 
and they're going to be the bad guys in this story, but they're not necessarily bad people. Right? You know, they may well be right. These are people who wish to, to wish to further the advancement of science and want for it to be done in a, a disciplined and rigorous manner and certainly wish to question test tube guy on whatever his bizarre assumptions may be. The problem is that all too often today, this is where the discussion stops. Okay? There's a good idea, there's some doubts about the good idea, and there isn't a particularly good venue to proceed. I mean, you know, what's the obvious thing to do? Well, the obvious thing to do is, well, gee, we should try it. Um, you know, this is easier said than done. And this is what, as I work on Genie with, you know, and, and the NSF works on Genie, and as those of you who have been doing Genie projects with me for years working on a Genie, this, you know, what we're doing is we're building, you know, a, a nationwide infrastructure to let someone try out some of these crazy ideas. And we're stocking this infrastructure with, you know, things that look like computers and things that might look like uh, data centers that come and support cloud-like entities. And we're standing up some uh, WiMAX uh, base stations and we're putting uh, SDN-enabled switches and, uh, you know, computing devices inside the network so that you have some chance to try out whatever a location-based social network might be or whatever your particular idea is, as long as it's one of those things that fits within the four program everything everythings, right? and, and try it out. Well, it seems like an obvious approach. This story has a happy ending. <coughs> you then, so I, I'll do a tiny little bit, tiny little bit of, of, of genie, uh, technical material uh, in here, even though this was a vision talk. Um, so the, you know, the, the, the vision part of Genie is program everything. The concession to reality part is, well, if I can program everything, then I'm probably screwing up somebody else. Okay. And the, the underlying, and, and I won't spend any time on the design issues, I'm, I'm glad to. This is what I spend most of my life worrying about. Uh, are these particular design issues. But the underlying notion is, well, if we could slice, the wor slice all these resources, virtualize them, and make a virtual <laughs> slice of these different sorts of resources available to, in this case, a uh, test tube guy for his particular experiment in uh, whatever the heck it was, uh, location-based social networks, then if I can provide some level of isolation so that other things can happen down here, the large community of users who we want to engage, we call these people opt-in users in Genie, but the, the large community of users can view you know, these new services as not different in any meaningful way from the network they're using. They don't care whether my network is based on an entirely different set of protocols and is not using IP. Really ought not to matter. You know, they probably do need to make some decision about deciding to turn it on, but I can entice them to do that by telling them how great my service is. Okay. Well, we're not taking away their internet. That's the first slice on your radio dial. But, you, know, you might want to turn the dial and pick something different or better. You know, from the point of view of the experimenter, this is a whole new world. I've got a whole clean slate to work on. From the point of view of an end user, nothing changed. You know, this is the way it should be. And at the end, you know, hey, this is great. You know, I'm writing a lot of papers. I'm spinning out a company, making a jillion dollars, you know, whatever it is. You know, but I can actually learn something as opposed to sitting in a room having people shake their heads and you know, indicate suspicion that uh, this is ever going to work. I've actually built up a satisfied user base okay, who you know, maybe if they're particularly technically inclined are kind of curious about how we did that, but you know, maybe they don't care. And those, those well-wishers who have always, you know, 
favored this particular technology ever since the beginning. Uh, they too are vindicated and, you know, would really, really like to see this whole process accelerated a good deal more and can't believe we've been dinking around all this time. <laughs> so that's the happy story. Which kind of raises the obvious question. If location-based social networks are running on slice one and you know, everything else in the world that we've come to know and love as the internet is running on slice zero, well, you know, what, what goes here? Which, I mean, is of course why we're all in the room, right? <laughs> um, what goes there is, is, is whatever we put there. Um, but I've talked to some people who have some ideas about things that go there. Um, I, in work with Genie, people have had you know, somewhat different visions of what they could make the internet be, the next internet be, when they were able to program some of these parts. I'll show you a few examples, and then I'll, I'll sit down. So, I, I think I'm going to pigeonhole these things a bit more than is fair, but sort of in the interest of making a point. Um, let's talk a little bit about people who mostly were interested in programming the network. So what if you thought that the network, uh, rather than being made up of you know, this sort of in undifferentiated mass of uh, individual computers, was otherwise made up of controllable paths and flows? You know, if you thought that, you might be um, Brighton Godfrey. Um, and this is his student, Ashish, who I think finished and is actually no longer technically at uh, Urbana-Champaign, but I'm not sure. Um, and you might have an idea about pathlet routing. Okay, and you might want to try that out uh, on Genie. So what's pathlet routing? Well, let's not go too deep, but pathlet routing uh, tries to open up a little bit uh, the control of where your packets go that's otherwise uh, exclusively reserved for uh, your service provider. Now, you're not going to get full control in this particular model because your service provider is unlikely to want to give you that, but maybe a little bit, a little bit. Enough so you can make smart decisions like saying, I have two paths uh, for this data to traverse the country, and I can at least tell if something went wrong and adapt. Okay, and here's a little demonstration. It's kind of hard to tell which one of these video streams froze and which one did not in a still picture. This one froze. This one is still moving. Another way to think about programming the network is instead of thinking in paths, you think about control. You know, what if I could locate little tiny modules of important behavior at important places inside the network, sort of near to wherever the particular action is? Okay, so if I wanted to do that, I might be um, Henning and Jay Wu at Columbia. And these guys have a notion called NetServe. Uh, NetServe is an unapologetic throwback to active networking uh, for anybody who's out of the, uh, the academic networking community. For those who aren't, don't worry. It's an unapologetic throwback to something you've never heard of. And the way um, NetServe works is by placing, picking some routers at interesting points in your particular network and having a security capable so it's reasonably safe, um, dynamically loadable set of modules that you can shove into a router and turn on in order to create a particular behavior. Uh, so there are several uh, different behaviors that these guys have, have shown off uh, using NetServe, but um, since I showed a, a video example just a second ago, I won't do the video con content distribution network version where you know you put the content close to the source. Um, let's look instead at a denial of service attack prevention for, um, uh, in this case, this is for SIP servers. These are the, the devices that um, initiate uh, uh, connections for uh, sort of voice over IP and other uh, session oriented connections. So if you imagine a uh, distributed denial of service attack uh, picking on this poor server in the middle of the country coming from you know, many sources spread around. 
uh, you get this concentration effect, right? As I, and this is one of the basic ideas behind many denial of service attacks, right? as I come in from lots of different places, you know, all that badness gets focused in the middle. Well, you know, if I could get these guys, uh, the, the intermediate routers, you know, in between to do just a little bit of rate limiting for me, and I can ameliorate this problem significantly. So you know, this is another uh, little thing you can do with some clever bits of network programming. I'm not going to go deep on any of these. You know, the point is to say we're enabling a lot of different sorts of innovation. I'm happy to go deep on, well, at least the ones I understand, uh, if anybody wants to catch me afterwards. So let's talk about programming the cloud a little bit. You know, what if I wanted to squeeze maximal resources out of my cloud, and I wanted to maintain flexible management so that as user needs changed, I could migrate things transparently. So then I'd be Prasad uh, from Ohio State. Um, and he's got a system called Virtual Desktop Cloud. Okay. And the, the overall goal here is to uh, do clever management of cloud resources at multiple data centers, well, located wherever you happen to have them. Um, in his particular case, I think he's managing here um, a mini data center in Utah and a mini data center at his lab in Ohio State. He's deploying uh, virtual machines that are scaled to uh, particular users' needs. He's uh, migrating them uh, as needed, and he's avoiding um, users detecting that, or at least uh, they can detect it, users caring uh, by switching the traffic um, un underneath uh, using OpenFlow. It's a relatively simple approach. It's really cool. And uh, Enough said. You know, and what if you um, what if you wanted to separate sort of the assumptions we have, the two assumptions we have about um, people's associations with devices and about devices' associations with uh, locations and topology in the network? You know, things move, people move, people are many to one associated with devices or one to many, but the other way from the traditional way of thinking about it. Then you might be the mobility first team uh, at Rutgers and elsewhere. Uh, and you might put together you know, a pretty hairy uh, configuration of, of Gini resources to try this out um, using a combination of wireless, uh, I'm sorry, of, um, of, of YMAX wireless base stations here and here, um, and try out your whole new clean slate routing scheme in the middle your whole new clean slate addressing scheme in the middle, your whole new uh, timing and connectivity sensitive uh, data delivery scheme on the edges. You know, I, I, that sounds pretty fancy, but I think it basically amounts to, you know, if my device can actually talk to a wireless uh, transmitter, then it might be a good time to send the data as opposed to when I can't. Okay, so those were examples. You know, I think um, this is the what, what do we do now? You know, what, what the, the people here, uh, you know, in this room do now? And there are probably a few things we should worry about right away. Um, and you know, I, I raised my hand before to volunteer to help. This is the kind of stuff I'd particularly like to help with. Um, you know, when I made this chart, a light bulb was a good thing. Jake has apparently now reduced light bulbs <laughs> to being old, boring ideas. That was not the intent. <laughs> you know, please have a good idea. It can look like a light bulb if it has to. <laughs> 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 you know, but things worth worrying about today, you know, do you have a good idea? Do you have a burning need? You know, wh what is it you want to do with the resources that are brought to you by US Ignite and supplemented by Genie? Who cares? Right. Who is going to use this? How do we bring them into the room? How do we attract your user base? How do we make sure they're happy? How are you going to try it out? How will you put this 
onto some initial set, granted, but some set of physical resources so that you can actually verify that this idea works and that it satisfies the needs of real people. Let's do those now. Let's put off some of the things that the naysayers might want to talk about. So no naysayers. <laughs> I mean, later, but not right away. They like to talk about forklifts, as in the forklift upgrade. For those who don't know this expression, this is, well, this is a great idea, but it would require that we upgrade every piece of equipment in the entire internet, so we're not going to do it. OK. That's a, it's a very good engineering objection to lots of things. There are lots of, you, you really can't make a, I don't know, multi tens of billions of dollars forklift investment in changing out the entire internet every time you have an idea. But we're certainly not going to motivate anybody to do anything if we don't have any ideas and we don't have any users. Let's not worry about this yet. <laughs> OK. Do that later. Let's go have some ideas. You know, and um, we'll work at this level. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much.